Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, September 14th, 2017 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz, the chair of the school committee. Uh, we'll begin the meeting this evening by having the clerk call the roll of the school committee. Here. 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 <laughs> Present. Present. Excellent. So uh, we will now move into the public comment period. Um, we, I do have a list of folks who have signed up um, and given me their name and address. And I would just ask that when you do speak that you um, please state your name and address for the record just so we have it for the record. Um, I do have a um, three minute timer, which I'm furiously trying to uh, get set up here. Um, <coughs> I don't want to rate the app. I just want to start the app. <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, okay. So, just one second. Um, excellent. I'm sorry. Okay, great. Okay. So, the floor is yours, Julie. My name is Julie Spencer Robinson. I live at 248 Spring Grove Avenue. I would like to register my disgust for the way in which you conducted negotiations for my continued full-time release from the classroom to serve as president of the Northampton Association of School Employees. After 70 hours of collaborative contract negotiations last year, you chose to revert to an adversarial bargaining strategy for this issue, but you didn't tell us. We entered negotiations fully expecting to renew our existing agreement because you never gave an indication that you wouldn't, and we were instead blindsided by your complete rejection of any release time at all. We sent you our request to bargain full-time release on May 1st, but you wouldn't meet with us until June 29th, which was just after I'd signed all six collective bargaining agreements, so we couldn't use that as leverage. You waited until school was out for the summer when it was difficult for us to mobilize our members who had voted overwhelmingly in support of a full-time president at our annual meeting in April. And then your stonewalling continued. You didn't return to the bargaining table for a month and a half on August 10th, the same day as your regular meeting. This timing pressured us to respond to your counterproposal on the spot with no time for thoughtful consideration or exploration of other options. And you knew we couldn't afford your proposal, which would require a dues increase of $150 per member because teacher salaries in Northampton rank 383rd out of 404 districts in Massachusetts. And 40% of our members belong to MPS support units your lowest paid employees. At our final session on August 16th, we agreed to part-time release on your terms for one year only to give our association leadership team a chance to regroup and reassess. But on August 18th, you informed us that part-time release was no longer an option. I subsequently learned that an eighth grade history teacher had quit that week. So you used the association and you used me to solve your staffing problem at JFK. I'm still stunned by these unanticipated, unsavory actions. Rather than your tactical maneuvers, we had expected a discussion of our shared interest in a healthy union that gives a collective voice to the people who work directly with Northampton's children, a recognition of the positive impact that labor management collaboration has on, on uh, student achievement, an, an acknowledgement that it is the unionization of our employees that sets the Northampton Public Schools apart from area charter and private schools. Woo. You betrayed our trust, and if you consider yourselves to be educational leaders of our district, you set a very poor example for how people ought to treat each other. Amen. But, But as an educator, I also believe that people should have a chance to fix their mistakes and try again. It's not too late for you to do the right thing and agree to renegotiate release of the NACE president, this time in good faith. Yeah. The next speaker who signed up is Beth Adams. Good evening. My name is Beth Adams. I live at 148 Crescent Street, and I've lived in Northampton and been a teacher at Northampton High School 
since 2000. This is my 18th year teaching math at Northampton High School. I'm speaking tonight about the recent decision by the school committee to deny release time for the president of our school employees union. During the early years of my time at Northampton High School, there were annual union meetings, and some years there were additional meetings when we were negotiating a new contract. At these meetings, there were usually strident arguments that had a tone of us versus them, especially during contract negotiation seasons. In recent years, there has been a noticeable shift away from this adversarial tone towards a deliberately collaborative one. Our current administration has shown a genuine desire to work with school employees to make our schools as effective as they can be. This showed up in a very tangible way in our contract negotiations that were finalized in June for all eight units in our union after many hours of meetings between school employees and administration. My understanding is that this interest-based bargaining was a far more positive process than previous negotiations that pitted one side against the other with lawyers mediating the process. While many school employees were involved in this, we had a steady leadership from our union president to guide the process and keep us informed. This is just one example of the countless ways our union president has been able to support and represent hundreds of Northampton Public School employees. We have been kept abreast of licensure requirements from DESE. We had strong leadership when we mobilized to fight the charter school question on the state ballot last fall. And most importantly, the administration has access to a representative of the employees who make our schools what they are. Decisions that are made with knowledge, input, and ideas from people who are working in each of our schools will make them better places for the children of Northampton. The recent decision by the school committee to deny release time to our union president communicates to us that collaboration is no longer a priority. Without the time our president has had, the collaborative work that has occurred could not have happened. I am a full-time math teacher at Northampton High School, and I love walking into my school every morning. I work with terrific students and colleagues, and I enjoy my days at work. That said, however, my job is overwhelming, and I am not able to say yes to many other requests made of me. I believe this is true for many of us who work in public schools. If we have a union president who is only able to help represent us and communicate with us and others in the district in his or her after school time, our collective contribution to making our schools the best they can be will be severely compromised. And that is why we assessed ourselves additional union dues to pay the salary of a full-time release union president. I'm baffled and confused by your desire to stand in the way of the progress we've made as a union and as a, and as a district. And I hope you're willing to reconsider that decision. It's very important to us. Thank you. The next speaker is Michael Staveley Hale. I dropped my note. Oh, here it is. Hi, my name is Michael Stavely Hale. I live at 52 Hatfield Street, <coughs> ESP in the, at, the JF, at JFK uh, Middle School. I've been here four years. As an ESP, I work with some of the most vulnerable and challenging kids in the system. Uh, the way I've been able to do my job is because I'm able to put out a lot of love. But I could not do this if I did not have strong support behind me, the kind of strong support that I get having a full-time union president. We, pay, we agreed to pay, raise our dues so that we could have a full-time union president because we thought that it was something that was useful. And I know many of you agree with us that it's a good thing for the union to have a full-time person. Um, I don't, so I don't understand the decision of, of thwarting the will of the union that, that we would like to have this. We agreed, to, we put up the money to pay for it and yet we're being told we don't get to have it. Or at least that's what I've been told, that we were told that we don't get to have it. But, from conversations with individuals on the committee, I understand that maybe it's more that we don't get to have it the way that we've had it, but that in principle we should be able to talk something through. I'd really like to hear more about that tonight. Uh, in conclusion, I just want to note that to do what we do, to do what we do, is because we're able to come up with a lot of love for the children of this district, and we do. We love your children. We take good care of them. We work hard to take good care of them. In my position, I'm taking care of kids who are 
who are really, really challenged, kids who can't, kids who can't read, kids who don't process information the way that we all do, kids that come from really, really bad situations at home, and that school is their safe place and that we provide that for them. And so because we're the people that do it through the caretaking and we know what's best for us so that we can do what's best for you and your children, and we ask you to rethink this decision. Thank you. The next speaker is Mary Cowie. My name is Mary Cowie. I live at 29 Laurel Park, Northampton. I've been teaching at Jackson Street School for the last 20 years. In fact, I've taught some of your children. I'm also a member of NACE, and I serve as a building delegate. I'm passionate about teaching and about social justice. I've chosen to continue living and teaching in Northampton all these years because this is a community that reflects many of my values, including dedication to social justice. That doesn't mean that any of us get it right all the time. Just like we tell our students, we need to have a growth mindset and learn from our mistakes. I'm here tonight because I feel you have made a mistake in refusing to allow full-time or even part-time release for the NACE president. The decision was felt as an attack on our union. As insulated as we may sometimes feel here in the Happy Valley, Northampton is not an island. Change is happening in this country, and it's happening fast. If you were one of the 1,400 people who stood on the streets of Northampton for hours last February waiting to get into the town hall meeting with Senator Markey, you know that our community is not going to sit back complacently in the face of injustice. Attacks on teacher unions are not new. We've seen the result of Republican Governor Scott Walker's attacks on public employee unions, including teacher unions in Wisconsin. We've seen the result of Betsy DeVos's agenda to privatize public education in Michigan through charter schools and other schemes that purport to offer choice. And now, she's the Secretary of Education. One of Trump's first moves as president was to appoint Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court, virtually guaranteeing the fifth vote necessary to eliminate agency fee and make every state in the country a right-to-work state. I'm asking you to reopen negotiations with NACE to negotiate release for our president. The school committee decision to refuse full-time release for our union president was felt by our members as an attempt to silence our voices. I am here tonight to say we will not be silenced. Our working conditions are the learning conditions of Northampton students. We will speak up for our union because that is how we stand up for our students. I urge you to reopen negotiations for the NACE president's release time immediately. Thank you. The next person signed up is Andrea Agito. Good evening. Would you mind turning the timer around? Yeah, it's kind of, right. for some reason, it's gone crooked on me here. I'm not That's sure okay. why. It won't, it won't rotate. <laughs> Thank so, you. Yep. That's okay. I'm Andrea Agito of Florence, and I'm also the NACE Unit A Chapter Coordinator. When I spoke at your July meeting, I explained why it was so important to our employees that they have a full-time release president. I talked about the collaboration that has occurred because we had a leader who had time to organize meetings and facilitate joint labor management collaboration. I talked about the grievances that were never filed because issues were addressed and resolved at the building level. I'm here tonight to talk about respect. Respect for our employees and respect for our union. Due to our members' overwhelmingly, overwhelming support, voting to raise their dues, we are now in a position to negotiate the full-time release of the NACE president into all eight contracts at no additional cost to the district so that it's not a year-by-year -year decision. By refusing to negotiate this release time, you are going against the employees of this district. 
you are choosing to dismantle five collaborative committees made up of employees and administrators that have been working diligently to improve our district for all students. You are creating an adversarial relationship between this committee and the employees of the Northampton Public Schools. Many of you are concerned about the instability created when a teacher takes a role outside of the classroom. This is true, but it's always a risk we take when a position is created and it is most beneficial for the district that it be filled by an experienced teacher. Case in point, our Director of Curriculum and Instruction, our Director of Technology Integration, Title I teachers, and most recently our elementary literacy coach and early childhood specialist. These positions, if eliminated, would result in the bumping of less senior teachers who replace them in the classroom. Like all of these advanced positions in our district, our employees deserve an experienced teacher to be leading our union. Currently, we have a Northampton graduate filling a leave replacement at JFK. If you reinstate the full-time release now, this young, talented teacher can stay in his position. You question the accountability of our president. The president of NACE is accountable to the entire membership, and all of the work do done is at the request of the executive board and the executive committee, made up of elected members from every school and unit in our association. We have full access to the president's calendar, and we know exactly how that full-time release is being used. The president doesn't do anything in a vacuum. You mentioned budget concerns that are coming down the pike in the next few years and not wanting to look like you're union busting if you lay off the union president due to budget cuts. Since this release time doesn't cost the district any additional funds, there would be no reason to dismantle our union system as a result of budget cuts. So instead, you're doing your union busting now? By refusing to negotiate a full-time release president, you are telling our membership that you do not respect their professionalism, and you are silencing our voices. We would love to know how each one of you stand on this issue, so your constituents will be calling you to ask your position on negotiating a full-time president for our employees. I really hope we can sit down soon to make this right. Thank you for your time. The next speaker is Sharon Carlson. Yes, my name is Sharon Carlson, and I am the Vice President of NACE at this time. I will first want to say, shame on you. You are going backwards to a time where teachers mistrusted the school committee and felt we weren't being listened to. I don't really think you want to go there, or have us think that you are union busting. At least I hope not. Secondly, a full-time release president strengthens the association from the grassroots as it adds to the effectiveness of the local. A full-time release president can develop and promote policies and practices that define a quality educational profession. A full-time president can gather key learning policies that will benefit student learning, and those practices will improve quality education. The president can develop policies around family and community partnerships develop and nurture high quality teaching practices, and empower our teachers to lead the profession for our students. We cannot afford in this day and age to have, not have a full-time release president. It's a disservice to the educators and staff of the Northampton school system to not have what they know they need and want. Thank you. The next person signed up is Mary Ellen Bradley Gilbert. Hello, I'm Mary Ellen Bradley Gilbert of 172 Overlook Drive in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Um, as I entered the school today and stood at my classroom greeting students, one of the first girls who walked through the door said, why are so many teachers wearing that same T-shirt you're wearing? And I said, because we are a team and we are getting together tonight to talk to people, other grown-ups, about what we need as teachers to be the best possible teachers for you as students. And she said, oh, great. <laughs> um, I have lived here now for 17 years with my husband, Bruce. He works at Cooley Dixon's Hospital. He's a therapist. He, we, the two of us came to our careers believing in 
in social justice and in serving others and being part of the community and living out our values through a true livelihood. He is a therapist at Cooley Dickinson Hospital up on West Five. He sees many of the families in this, in this valley. I work with many of the students of those same people that he sees every day. We are on the front lines. We know the people of Northampton. We know their families. And I am a special education teacher now in my 10th year at Bridge Street School. I have brought a career that began when I was 27. And as you can see, that was a long time ago. I brought my experience to this, this town because I believed in this valley. I believed in its liberal values, and I, I believed that the five college area would no doubt be a place where my, my own student, my own children, would be finding a fine education, an excellent education. I have been disheartened by some of the conditions within our schools and our classrooms, greatly disheartened. But I have not given up. I show up every day, and I work as hard as I can, and I advocate for the special needs students that I do who have severe neurological impairments, dyslexia, issues with processing and memory. I sit at the table. I give them a voice. I give their families a voice. I've sat at the tables in Northampton High School giving my own children, my daughter with a severe brain injury from a birth condition that she, she had to have surgery for. I've given her a voice. I know how to give people a voice. I am asking you to give us a full-time voice at the table, not a part-time voice, not a minimize, minimized voice, not minimize the way in which teachers' voices are being minimized all throughout the country right now. I want a full voice. And the only place, way I'll have it is if Julie has a full voice. Without her, I wouldn't have known that I could get a, a union lawyer to fight for me to get back nine years of creditable service that I have put in and dedicated. I was discredited by the MTRS. Had I not been able to reach her immediately and have her respond immediately to my needs that, and let me know I could have a lawyer, I would never have known that I had the right to fight for those years. I'm fighting because it's a big fight for teachers now just to be seen as creditable. Credible. And so I'm asking for a full voice at the table, not a part-time voice. I want my union president to be available to me and to the students and families of this city. The next speaker signed up is Barbara Rakoska. Hi, I'm Barbara Rakoska, 571 Florence Road. Um, I'm a cafeteria delegate for the union, and I've worked for the city for 33 years. And this is the first time I've ever seen something come down like this before. Union members, even the lowest paid, had voted for a pay for a rate a yeah, dues increase so that we could have a full time president release president. She has done so much with the IBB and to get us to all work collaboratively that now we all understand each other and it's for all the kids that are here that we're doing this. She needs to be available when we need her. From teachers to custodians to ESPs, nurses, administration, cafeteria, she serves eight union um, units. That's a lot. In two districts, because she does um, Smith Folk also. Maybe it's time for a meeting of the whole school committee and a few union reps to actually get both sides out and understand each other collaboratively like we did negotiating. And then we'll all understand each other's sides and why things are happening like they are and nobody will feel like they're being pushed under the rug. Thank you. The next person signed up is Paula Regano Murray. <coughs> oh, I got that right. My name is Paula Regano Murray. I live at 45 Finn Street in Northampton. I'm a parent of two alumni from NHS. I am an ESP at NHS. I am the wife of an alum. 
a property owner and a taxpayer in the city of Northampton, and most importantly tonight, a member of the Northampton Association of School Employees. My roots run deep. I am baffled by the decision of the Northampton School Committee with regard to the agreement for full-time release of our president. I wrote to every member on the school committee with regard to the agreement. I wrote to every member of the school committee asking them to please reconsider this decision. Only one member ever replied. One. I serve as a delega delegate not for what I can get out of my union for me personally, but for what I can do for my fellow union constituents. I expect the same from elected, the elected members of our school committee. And yet the one person to respond to my email cited what seemed to be a pretty personal issue. The full-time release of the president is too disruptive. It seems two years ago, his son was in a class taught by the union president. It was extremely difficult for his son when she left, and for that, I truly am sorry. But for this, he apparently blames our union. The reality is we were ready in August for full-time release, and it was the school committee that dragged their feet, not allowing for her release for those two months. So to that one member who replied, if you are looking for someone to blame, then look no further than to your left or to your right. Our union is stronger today than it has ever been thanks to the full-time release of our president. Teachers and support staff knew that they could reach her at a moment's notice if they needed help. Administrators, the superintendents, and even the school committee had access to her. We increased our enrollment, decreased grievances, and we stood together and for one another in a collaborative fashion for 70 hours this spring. And I thank everyone involved, including the school committee, for what we were able to accomplish. We spoke up and we voiced concerns over issues that impacted school employees and ultimately the children of Northampton, your children. Make no mistake, I love my job. I love my school and I love my city, but we have just begun to find our voice and we will not go back to being silent, please reconsider and renegotiate the full-time release of our union president. Thank you very much. Suzanne Strauss is the next speaker signed up. I'm Suzanne Strauss. I live at 809 Ryan Road and speak to you as a voter a taxpayer, a parent of children who went to both Jackson Street and Northampton High, and as a teacher and union member for 20 years in the English department at the high school. I am also a building delegate. I am here in service of justice and benevolence and the well-being of our school-aged children. The school committee's most recent refusal to grant full-time release to our union president stinks. It is important that you know how angry, dedicated professionals feel in all bargaining units, especially long-serving staff who have had the opportunity to ride the regular wave of collaboration on our part, only to be smashed into the sand when the powers that be fail to do likewise. When we collaborated around no on two, the tax overrides, the mayoral elections, and signing a contract that gives us a pittance of a raise, and then you turn around and refuse to honor what we believe to be a tacit agreement, you are union busting. Transparency is justice. We are smart, caring folks whose professional opinion should matter in educational decisions. Having a full-time union president allows us a seat at the table absent from, absent, which we've been absent from for far too long. If you look at the system as a triangle, one angle is administrators, one is the school committee, the third should have people who provide direct services to students. That's our union and that's justice. We're not going to reach our potential as a system without that. Our union had a response to the decision to change special education in the elementary schools last spring that I know the school committee was eager to hear. That's collaboration and that's benevolence. Having a union president allows many issues and problems to be sorted out easily and without grievance. I wonder how many of you would like to get a phone call every time there's a perceived contractual issue. On the very first day of school this year, I had no less than three union issues to deal with at the high school. If that happens even 100 days a year in nine buildings, you're talking about 2,700 issues per year, 
and that is only counting one delegate per building. Would you like to receive 2,700 phone calls per person this year? And that's just a fraction of our work. Furthermore, the school committee received a significant raise this year, almost double what you had been paid, which amounted to thousands of dollars per committee member, as well as continued health care benefits. That's much more than anyone in any bargaining unit received. I have not doubled my salary in 20 years of service here. Do you think I should get more money? Do I think you should get more money? Yes, I do. That's benevolence. Justice implores that our system also uses resources to give the president full-time release. I am so tired of the excuses that we don't have enough money to do things in Northampton. It's not true, and it's demoralizing. Let's figure out ways to work together to solve these kinds of inequities. That's benevolence. I'd like to end with two thoughts. For those of you sitting in front of me who are MTA members in other districts and voted against having release for a full-time president, that is simply not okay. Second, all of you have the power to change this decision. Doing the right thing is not necessarily doing the easy thing. Do the right thing. You can decide tonight to repair Harmony by reinstating the full-time union president. Uh, the next speaker signed up is Garrett Adams. I'm uh, Garrett Adams, 148 Crescent Street, Northampton. And um, I'd like to speak tonight uh, not just as a union member, no sign of disrespect <coughs> to my fellow members. Uh, I'm resigning my official delegate capacity because we have full slates of delegates from both the two schools where I was split to work. Also, I prefer to speak as Mr. Adams and have Pocket Bear here with me and bring to you a message similar to what I've brought before, that we are all better when we all respect each other and we all work together. And you've heard, I think, a lot. What I really want to specifically point out to you, because I suspect that like, there's not enough money, drives all kinds of things. Um, but why is it worth it to the school committee in the town of Northampton for the union to have a full-time release president. Um, one specific thing that's been a huge improvement is our automated substitute system, which our office workers it, it sat with and our full-time release president helped to coordinate the improvement of that situation. We don't have enough substitutes now, but we know sooner that there are not enough, and we more often have someone in the position who's familiar with the students or the age group or the subject area or the school. Uh, that's an tangible example of something that's been accomplished as a mutual interest through full-time release of our president. Uh, professional development. It's in the interest that our teachers with our children are as b trained as possible, and we want that as teachers, and the district has an obligation to see that curriculum and instruction is being provided in the way that they want. That's a total mutual interest that needs coordination by someone being able to be at the table when a new thing comes down from DESE that's a little half-cocked. It, we have perspective. Uh, the teacher evaluation system is another example of, of mutual inference of interpretation of something that's coming from the Department of DESE is the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education for people who are watching at home or other places, but that's a place of common interest interface that we can only help you with and thus our children with and all of our employees with through being available and being at the table and being able to respond. Northampton is a strong district. Let's build it and work together. Next person signed up is Michelle Eastman. Hello.
Hello, my name is Michelle Eastman. I live at 14 Northern Ave. And good evening. I have worked as a teacher in this great city for eight years, 10 counting my substitute teaching and student teaching. I'm a dedicated employee. My grandmother was also a dedicated employee to Northampton. She retired in 1991 and has a bench overlooking the playground in, mem in celebration of her. She was also a building principal. I'm here tonight to express my disappointment with your decision to change your mind about the full-time release president. We've supported it and we thought you did too. I'm not sure who made the decision, but I'm here to let you know I think it's a poor one. We want to build community, not tear it down. This tears down our community. I have a story to share. I was out taking a daily walk when I was approached by a school committee member. He asked me to sign for his reelection to school committee. I listened. I signed in good faith. He asked me one question. What can I do to support teachers? I responded, help us continue to build community. I am here asking, please build community and reverse your decision. Please support our community by giving us what we already agreed upon. Thank you. So there's no one else signed up on the sheet. Uh, is there anyone else who wishes to speak during the public comment? Okay. O okay. If you just state your name and address. <coughs> I'm Kate Ballard. I live at 48 River Road, and I'm a science teacher at the high school. And I've been there for like 12 years. Um, and I just want to say that since the time that we've had the first the full-time president, um, I just feel so much more informed. I don't have enough time <laughs> usually to keep up on all that's going on the state level or even at the local level and all the committees and negotiations and uh, she has made me feel so much more connected. I think most teachers don't have enough time to keep up and uh, for me it's made a world of difference in my understanding and my feeling of connection to the school district. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else in public comment? Okay. Thank you all for participating in the public comment period. Um, with that, we have to move on in our agenda. Uh, the next item on the agenda is announcements from the school committee. Any announcements from the school committee? Okay. Uh, next, we have a set of recommended actions on our consent agenda. Uh, the first is, uh, well, actually, the only section is the field trip requests. We've got the Jackson Street fifth graders going to the Nature's Classroom in Beckett, Massachusetts, October 10th through the 13th, 2017, and the JFK Wright Flight Program at the New England Air Museum in Windsor Locks, Connecticut, um, October 19th, 2017. I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, all those in favor of the approving the consent agenda, please say aye. aye. <coughs> Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the consent agenda is approved. Um, we'll now move into reports and recommendations. Um, it was, uh, it's a report, it's not a vote or a deliberation. It was, uh, we were unclear about the timing, whether we would have a student representative, but in fact, our student representative's here. So I'll turn it over uh, to Elena Fragamini to give the student representative report. 
Yes, hi. So um, I've been reelected as student representative um, by the student union. Um, I was reelected last June, um, so you had me through the summer, and now you have me again until May. <laughs> um, so the NHS students from Northampton High have been settling into the new year, um, in large part to our amazing building staff, faculty, and teachers, um, who have really made it a smooth transition um, and a really wonderful experience to start the new school year. Um, the Peer Advisory League, which is known as PAL, um, is a mentorship program that was created with guidance from the Northampton High School Council. Um, they've been helping new students get acclimated to Northampton High. On the first day, members of PAL were um, stationed at the front of the building to greet students and direct them to their classes. Um, and they've been having a table in the guidance area and in the cafeteria um, to help new students with any questions they may have, have someone to sit with at lunch, um, truly make people feel welcome. Um, some of the organizers and participants of the JFK March Against Sexual Harassment last spring have moved up to NHS and have joined the Feminist Collective. We're so excited to collaborate with them to improve student experience at the high school, and the Feminist Collective is looking forward to continuing the conversation that they started at JFK. The National Honor Society has been working with Ms. Fabin, the NHS librarian, to create a new collaborative study space in the library. The space opened yesterday on Wednesday and offers lots of food, tutors, and a smart board that will be set up shortly every Wednesday. Um, this is just one of the many new programs and activities that Ms. Fabin, our librarian, offers in the library, and NHS students are taking advantage of them, with many hoping that the library can be open for even more hours after school. Um, the Northampton High Musical was scheduled for November, but due to many scheduling conflicts, it's been postponed to some later date that is unknown yet. Um, fall sports are off to a great start. I would encourage all of you to attend some of our lively games. Um, this Friday, there will be a girls varsity soccer game at 4 p.m. at Northampton High, and later a football game at 7 p.m., also at Northampton High. If you'd like to hear uh, even more about what's going on at NHS, you can watch the transcript, Northampton High's student news broadcast, which comes out every Friday morning on nhstechnology.org. Um, this week we're featuring stories ranging from um, what new changes in DACA policy may mean for students at Northampton High, um, discussing advertising and athletics, and much more. Um, freshman elections are likely to be held the week of September 25th. Um, the school, the student body, freshman student body will be electing both class officers who uh, deal with fundraising and student union members and we're looking forward to having some new freshman student union members um, from that pool we will elect your student advisory committee and we're all looking forward to meeting with you in october thank you okay the next item on the agenda is the annual food services report uh, mr tranfaglia is here this evening the floor is yours thank you very much Thank you for having me once again. <clears throat> it's incredible to think that this is my third time presenting this report. Second time as the food service director, or at least as the food service director. I'll tell you what, man, fly, it, time flies by when you're having fun. We seem to really enjoy what we're doing down in the food service program. We've made a lot of changes over the last couple of years. We continue to try to make changes to grow the program in a positive fashion. School lunch program had a very productive and busy year. From high school improvements, a state review conducted, staff trainings, increased food related functions, providing lunch for Heck Academy, and the list goes on and on. The food service employees handled everything that was thrown their way as true professionals. They're very they are a very dedicated team that works incredibly hard within each school and combined as one department. I'm very proud to be working with all of my employees within the food service direct, or department. They're wonderful people. The first part I wanted to touch on was participation. And I'll kind of skim over the report a little bit. So, But if you have questions of something I didn't bring up, please don't hesitate. <clears throat> As we look at the participation, we see that some of the numbers went down from the previous year. Um, As I started to dig into it a little bit more, there was a couple small key factors. First key factor was half days. As you start to look at half days, we are required to offer lunch for half days. It's really important that people at home understand that lunch is available on half days. And we encourage the students to, particip to, particip excuse me, to participate in the lunch program on half days. Right now it's very limited. In a conversation today, just talking about the middle school on half days, we serve 
only about 13, and I'll say on a max day, maybe 20 lunches. Where we serve a lot more lunches than that. So I encourage the students to participate more in that. Looking at the chart in front of you, if I was to pull out those half days, it actually increases participation by a couple percent across the board. As you look at the um, second line down, lunch participation type A meals percentage. <clears throat> the next piece I wanted to talk about, which I was very happy to see the direction that we're going, we went in the last couple years, we continued it this year, is the finances. We added $32,207 and some change from last year's snapshot, which means the one day we looked at it at the end of the year to make sure almost all bills, when I say almost all, I'm saying all bills were in, paid, money still coming in, that was all captured within that. We added that to the revolving lunch account. This was accomplished even though additional expenses such as staff clothing allowance, school delay pay, additional holidays. That was all part of the new contract on top of the COLA increase and we we're still able to increase the revolving account by more than $32,000. I'm very pleased with our results. Although this level of growth is going to be hard to maintain as staff payroll as well as program costs continue to go up but we will continue to keep looking at every avenue to try to maintain positive growth within the financial structure of the food service program. The next topic I wanted to touch on was the outstanding debt. You see the chart in front of you and as you can see in the first column, the current year debt continues to increase. Outstanding debt continues to increase from year to year. A huge amount of staff time goes into the process of sending bills, monitoring income and payments, and applying them to student balances. But we will continue to work hard at collecting the outstanding balances. It fluctuates when the money comes in and how it's applied in which year. We have tried to talk with some parents and to try to work out either a payment plan or an acceptable way of which they can make payments. Looking at the overall debt, it's a small percentage of families that owe the largest portion and probably 90% of that portion within 10 or 15 families. So I just wanted to point that piece of it out. <clears throat> the next topic I wanted to talk about was the Northampton High School improvements. This was a very, very fun project. <coughs> working on ideas keep popping into my head constantly and, and as I keep talking to just people that work in the school itself whether it be teachers the students custodians everyone throws these ideas at me and we keep trying different things and it's looking fantastic up there if you haven't been there you should check it out and it's only going to get better as we move along the process of improving the serve and seating areas of the high school and this year, a little bit at the middle school with some minor improvements. We're going to be adding some television style monitors set up for menus and different informational pieces here at JFK. But at the high school piece, we increased the seating areas. And when I say the in seating areas, not just within the cafeteria. We created a cafe style seating area that when you walk through the main doors, right heading up the stairs to the gymnasium, down below there was an open space. We created a cafe style type seating with brushed aluminum tabletops, chairs, seats about 20 people. What we found was the first day, it was full. The second day, it's full. It's full every day. It's working out very well, but not just for lunch. You go there in the middle of the afternoon, which I do on occasions, and kids are sitting down there actually doing work, homework, or just conversing. It's given them a great spot to just hang out and to feel like they're part of an area that they can relax in. It also helps because I believe by keeping students in that little area, I hate to say this, but they'll spend money. <laughs> they'll, they'll buy things. And we like, but I also like to be able to provide that service to them. And we'll continue to do that. We added more high top tables. If you've seen them, 
the ones that we put up there last year, we added a bunch more spread out throughout. We actually even put some outside under one of the little overhangs outside. They're all being used. One of the real fun ideas that we did this year was we put in a very large L-shaped couch off in one of the corners. It's a sectional couch. Didn't know how it was going to go over. It's full almost every day. Kids are sitting out there. We're going to be adding small little coffee tables so that kids can actually sit and converse within that area. But again, it's being used not just at lunchtime. It's actually being used all the time, which is a wonderful thing that I see. It gives the kids an area that they own. We're also going to be adding two 65-inch flat-screen TVs to replace the old TVs that were up there. Content will be controlled by, I believe, Jeremy Whalen and anyone else who would like to put input in. But I, I envision, someone said to me, they used to play The Price is Right, and the kids would play along, and they loved it. It's an idea. It's a thought. Maybe the kids will really enjoy that. Again, it gives them a, a spot that they can hang out, relax, and just let down their guard to be able to get back to their studies. We'll continue to keep looking at things. I talked to the art teacher just this morning. She emailed me. We're going to be doing some murals all around and really try to spruce it up. We'll continue to keep adding things to make things better down there for the students so that they can relax and enjoy the time that they have down there. <coughs> As we move forward in the current year, we're already making changes to help continue a positive growth model for the food service program. <coughs> just to name a few. For the current year, at each of our elementary schools, we've selected to go from a serve style meal pattern, which we've done for a long time here in Northampton, to an offer versus serve model, which re requires students to select only three of the five items that have to be offered. Of course, they can take all five, and I want to stress that. They can, of course, still take all five if they so choose, but they no longer have to have all five to make it a type A reimbursable meal. And that's a key word there, type A reimbursable meal. That allows reimbursement from the government, also allows the benefit of free and reduced students to utilize their free and reduced status. It has to meet the type A program meal. But by going to offer versus serve, they can select less items if they so choose. We went with a hybrid model. We selected to go with they have to take the main entree and they have to have the vegetable. Most main entrees that we offer are what they call a combination item. Just today, taco salad. So they have the protein and the meat and the grain within the corn chips. All they would actually have to grab is the vegetable which we require them to take. They no longer have to take a milk, a juice, or a fruit. What we're seeing in this model, and this is a model that most I'd say 95% of the districts in the state utilize. Very few are serve only anymore. What we're seeing already in talking with the staff is we're opening and opening up one instance, one can of vegetable, I'm sorry, one can of fruit a day as opposed <coughs> to five, which may have just been being thrown out. Milk will slowly start to go down in how much we're actually, or actually the students are not consuming and you'll start to see some savings in the actual food waste. So we did start that this year and it seems to be working very well. We're adding a larger selection of a la carte items to the middle school. This is going to be a key piece for the middle school to help students have more choice but also to increase revenue for the food service department. All parents, very important, all parents have the ability on any child's account to make any restriction, request, or limitation upon the account. All a parent would have to do is just give us a call and we can talk them through the process. We actually take care of their account, but the parents just have to say, I only want little Johnny to buy $1 a day. I will say in my last district, my son was spending close to $13 a day. That's what made my last program successful. I think he single-handedly took care of the finances over there. Um, or should I say, I did. But that'll help over here. Plus, students are asking for it. And we're gonna, it, 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 every item that we serve will meet the state guidelines on what we can sell. Nothing will be beyond that. fun piece that's going to just came up recently that I'm actually excited about. We already have something lined up, but I'm not going to 
tell John yet until it's actually on the menu. We're going to be starting a local harvest of the month. I know this is something that everyone wants to get on board with. I know it's something that I, for years, have wanted to get on board with. We're starting to get a lot of support from different groups to assist within that program. We're going to make it happen. We've already contacted one vendor. We already set up for an order for October. All right, I'll ruin the surprise. We're going to be getting Atkins apples in, um, and we'll be trying some different other items around the area. One of the things that I look at when I'm doing this is the price difference between buying local apples and, of course, ordering them from one of our vendors. And as long as it's similar in price or close to price, we're going to do it. it I think it's something that, that is that important. We'll continue to look at, as product is available, of course, as the winter months come along, there's only so much butternut squash and miscellaneous items that you can utilize. But we'll continue to keep looking at products that are either processed from local farms and stored so that we can get them on a regular basis. But we are going to start with one day a month and possibly increase as time goes on to see where we can go with this. But there'll be a lot of advertising for the students around it, but also just for families. So please keep an eye on my section of the website to see what we'll be coming up with. We will continue to explore, try new concepts, and menu selections to create the best possible breakfast and lunch experience that will fit the needs of the students in our district while meeting the state and reg federal regulations. Thank you very much for your support. I really do appreciate it. And so does my staff. Thank you very Any much. Questions? Yes, to any members of the committee, Ms. Fallon. Uh, thank you for all your hard work. This sounds great. Um, I was just wondering, a couple community members asked how they could contribute to the school lunch debt. Um, was there any progress made on, like, is it possible that when they go to put money on their own student's account that we could have some sort of a donation button? We had talked about it, and I, I, I'm not sure that I heard the response, whether it's possible or not. We did. The conversation became, um, from what I understand, is are we looking to apply it to a specific student account, someone that a teacher or principal recognizes as a needy family that may not be uh, captured within a free and reduced type setting or status, um, or apply it to the overall accumulation of debt? And I think once that gets worked out, then we'll be able to figure out how to handle it. Okay. It ties in with another little piece, um, the, the milk piece of the a la carte, how to handle students that may want to milk that don't have money on account and so on and so forth. But it's something that we are going to be trying to work out pretty quickly. Once we do set it up, it's literally I, five minutes I can set the account up and anybody can make donations onto an account that then we can figure out where to apply it or how to apply it to accounts. So we will be looking into that shortly. Okay, so in the meantime, I think what I was told is they send a check to the Northampton Public Schools with a note saying where they would like the money to be applied, they very can, specifically. They can do that. If, they, if, if, if anyone decides, listen, I, I, little Johnny's family, I'd like to assist in that. It's not a problem at okay. all. We can, we can do that in the blink of an eye. Okay, thank you. And that's without setting anything up. We can apply. Mr. Reed. I just did a little math, which was never my favorite subject, and it looks like you increased a la carte sales at the high school by 2,000% in one year. And I just think you're like a role, you're like the, the perfect example of the growth mindset. You are just constantly trying to find ways to improve your department and do what people ask of you and bring in new ideas and respond to new ideas and it's really impressive and I just want to thank you. Thank you very much. I can't take all the credit. My staff are incredible and everyone around me feed me information incredible but thank you very much. I really do appreciate that. Thank you. Any other questions from members of the school committee? Okay. So um, as part of uh, Mr. Trenfalgo's report, we do have an annual vote that we take, um, which is a vote to participate in the National School Lunch Program. Uh, this is something that the committee's asked to take every year. And um, so I would first entertain a motion to approve that. And then if we would like to have discussion, debate, put it on the floor. Move to participate in the National School Lunch Program. Second. Okay. Um, 
Did you want to just for give for review for folks at home? Do you want to want to give a quick overview of what we're uh, what this means for the district? Absolutely. The National School Lunch Program is a program that allows us to participate in federal and state reimbursement and the status relating free and reduced applications and benefits to families to receive free or discounted meals. It also assists in commodities that we get into the program that are don I say donated, but offered to us from the state at very minimal cost. It's a really important part of the food service stability to be able to participate within this program. Okay. Any questions? Any? Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded to continue with uh, participation in the in the National School Lunch Program. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, Next item on the agenda, continuing with uh, food service. Um, this is a report uh, regarding a food service corrective action review. Correct. On January 9th and 10th, also on the 12th and 13th, the state conducted the food service review and found some corrective action items that we had to correct. Juliana Valcor, she's the education specialist for DESE who conducted the food service review. The review looks at every detail regarding the food service program and specific schools chosen and reviewed by the percent of free and reduced students within that school. So she usually picks the highest school that has the highest free and reduced participation or qualification in order to review. Of course, my office being here at JFK, she spent quite a bit of time in our office going through every detail within the food service program. I will honestly say that DESE, when they come in, they are here to help. They will find things, but they are here to help. They don't never just say, you're doing this wrong. They'll give you the technical assistance and guidance in order to make sure that it's not a repeat offense or a repeat finding. We have a state review that will happen every three years. It's part of the federal guidelines and regulations. <clears throat> the last one was conducted in 2014. <coughs> when we had ours, the areas that were of concern were a little less than what it was in 2014. But also different areas were found in 2014 as opposed to 2011. And I'm guessing because I'm here now and I'm, I wasn't here then. But that being said, all the areas have been corrected and new processes have been implemented to ensure these areas flagged will not be repeated. The correction action plan looks at very specific findings. We go through those findings. We have to write what we will do to correct them and they have to approve it and they did approve our correction <coughs> action plan. The overall consensus for our exit interview with Juliana Velcor, the reviewer, Candy Walzak and myself was that we have a very good program and that the areas flagged could and will be corrected and they have been. <clears throat> I'm not sure how you'd like to do look at this corrective action plan so I'll pick out a couple things but if you want to ask me questions on any specifics we'll go through. I wanted to touch on a couple of the ones that I see as the higher important. Not that they aren't all important. I want to make sure I stress that. <laughs> the very first one, certification and benefit issuance. They had a couple findings on <clears throat> how we approve either an application or how we classified someone through the virtual gateway. One of the things that was expressed to us is that they have a 10% threshold that they look at in finding of errors. So once they reach 10% or more, it becomes a much greater deal in how they handle it, whether it be financially or um, really stronger corrective action. We were only at about 3% of the applications. We changed the process in which we review and approve applications. It was new to us last year. And the reviewer constantly, Julie, Juliana kept saying, you guys did a good job, it's okay, these little glitches. We were able to correct all the issues 
every single application or every single finding within the time frame that she was here. So she was very happy about that, being here only four days. <clears throat> and please, I'm, I'm going to skip around a little bit, but if you need a specific. I have a specific. Go ahead. Could you please, I was just curious about the, the finding on the Buy American provision. Is this problematic because we're subject to that provision and our purchasing group isn't, or was it just the documentation wasn't relayed? Correct. Documentation wasn't relayed to us. It's the responsibility of the collaborative in order to make sure that we have the correct documentation. We can purchase something from out of country, but we have to have the documentation to prove that it's not produced within this country. And that's what we did not have as the collaborative. But that collaborative is subject to that same provision? Like, I was just wondering yes. if, okay, uh, okay. Yeah, so it's every, not an issue of, oh, the collaborative can't, isn't willing to do that. No, no, they, it was just a paperwork yeah, thing. Exactly. They all know that they have to produce it. And including the, any food service vendor that we purchase from, they also have to produce and say, the reason why we're going to support you with something from China I, I'm just I just chose that but from China is because we cannot get it anywhere else in the state okay. the, the funny part is that Alaska is included in that so if we were to get anything from Alaska we actually have to have documentation it's the continuous states so. <laughs> like, sorry Ann sorry about Hawaii I, know I had a problem with the Canadian beats but no. You did with the Canadian beats. I have actually two questions. Sure. The first is I saw that you had some portion issues, not right. issues, but port so that you were going to train staff. Will that be an ongoing thing or is that just like a one time? It, it will. In, it, it, there's a, it's kind of a double answer on that. Uh, they have been trained in what is expected of them, but because we also go to offer versus serve, there's different criteria yeah. between serve only and offer versus serve. Quick example, serve only says you have to have three quarters of a cup of vegetables. We are only offering a half a cup of vegetables. By going to offer versus serve, now you can only serve a half a cup of vegetables as long as you have multiple choices. We had the multiple choices in place, but because we have the paper statement saying we were, we were serve, we couldn't count it. Each one would have to be separate. So if they selected carrots over peas, you know, raw carrots over um, steamed US. peas, US. they had to be... <laughs> three quarters of a cup okay. where now we don't have to so all those corrections have been in place okay and then the verification can you just explain that to me where it says households were not given 10 days advance notification absolutely what does that mean what happens is so if we have an application that comes in mm -hmm. and actually not even an application I'm going to change it a little bit the verification our direct verification process mm -hmm. so we log into the virtual gateway we submit their first name, last name, and date of birth only. It then gives us a response on what their qualification may be. By no match means that they'd be a paid student. By exact match free mm -hmm. means that they would be a free student. And now they added th this year along where they say exact match reduced. Mm -hmm. So it would qualify the people as reduced. If we, we run reports, we're required to run them three times a year. I try to run them close to three times a month because today you may not qualify for a benefit, but you submitted somewhere assistance from the state. Tomorrow it may pop up that you now qualify. I want to make sure I try to capture them in a much faster pace than what they recommend. But this was about termination of benefits, giving a 10-day warning? Right. So what ends up happening is, as we ran one of the reports, it came up that they went from either a free student to a reduced or no longer or a paid student. We changed it in the computer without giving 10 day notice to the family. We changed it right away when we saw it. Mm -hmm. We didn't give a family 10 days notice to understand that their status was gonna change. So when it, I, I don't wanna belabor this, but when, the, uh, when a benefit is reduced or terminated, does that mean that for those 10 days, that student is given a 10-day leeway Correct. to continue to get Correct. the free? Yes, or to call and say, nope, there's been a change. It could be from virtual gateways based on information. I'm not sure how they determine, okay. but they could say, no, I just lost my job yesterday. Okay. I'll send in an application. Okay. They have to have a 10-day window in order to, either if they have an issue, to contact us. So were some of these students charged as part of our other yes. Before. Yes, and that and so that's, that's what they that's what they saw. Okay. They saw that a status changed. We started to charge them accordingly, but the family didn't receive the letter on within. Eight, oh, I'm sorry. 
within yeah. the correct 10 day time frame. Okay. Yeah. Any other? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Just to follow up sorry. on that. So then, so then, what was the corrective piece for the families, or for the money? For the money. What did you guys do? When we you we can adjust their account to give them back the their money. Yeah. And, and that's what we did. Just so you say it. Yes. You yes. Did. Yes. I just wanted you know. To say yeah. It. And that's exactly what we did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of course. <laughs> Any other questions about the corrective actions? Okay. This is uh, more for informational purposes, so there's no required vote. Um, thank you very much uh, for reviewing thank you that. Thank much. Us. Okay. Have a great night. You too. You too. Thank you thank very you. much. Okay. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a vote to authorize our continued participation in the East Hampton Boys Ice Hockey co uh, Cooperative. Directing the members' attention to the memorandum from Kara Dupree, I would ask um, for the community's continued support for Northampton to participate in its longstanding co-op program for boys hockey where East Hampton is the host city. Okay. Move to continue participation in East Hampton Boys Ice Hockey Cooperative. Second. Second. Okay. Any other um, discussion about this? Any questions? Okay. Hearing none, all those in favor of approving, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that is approved. Um, the next item on the agenda is a vote on an agreement between the Northampton School Committee and the City of Northampton for joint use of school and recreation facilities. And I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Provost. Thank you. Once again, directing the committee members' attention to what I hope you will have found to be the most rewarding piece of clothes <laughs> in the entire packet. <laughs> Uh, after several meetings um, with many department members, and I want to make sure that I acknowledge all of the members of the negotiating team that worked out this joint use agreement, Candy Walzak, Susan Wright, Kara Dupree, Anne-Marie Mojo, Tony Kuzniers, David Pomerantz, Stacy Blanco, and for a short period of time, Rich Parcelletti. Um, as you know from the document, um, it goes into very detailed descriptions of the terms and conditions under which the de city departments agree to work together to share public facilities. Um, as you know, this originally came to the committee because there was difficulty in providing a consistent implementation of the committee's building use policy. At first, it was thought that it could be corrected by adjusting the policy. Um, the Rules and Policy Committee ended up recommending to the full committee that we pursue a joint use agreement instead. This joint use agreement, I believe, um, does get us 95% of the way there to being able to have a consistently implemented building use committee, uh, building use policy rather. However, in the context of the many hours of discussion around the various issues involved with the joint use, it became clear that there are a few things that um, probably should be addressed through policy, um, some tweaks through uh, concerning insurance, for example. So I think that at a future meeting of the Rules and Policy Subcommittee, I will <laughs> bring that up. But the, the document that's before you now is just a joint use agreement. I. Um, can tell you I've received a report from the rec department's board of directors or commissioners, I'm not exactly sure, or trustees, how they're, how they're known. Um, they were very favorable to the um, agreement, and I hope this committee will be as well. Excellent. Um, and just let me add thank you, Dr. Provost, who kind of helped lead these uh, negotiations um, and, uh, and used I think interest-based bargaining as part That's of the process. Great. So uh, thank you for doing that, and uh, I'm looking forward to signing that document twice, actually, <laughs> as the, both the chair and the mayor. Um, I think it really is a good agreement, and I especially appreciate the fact that um, I like the preamble because I think it spells out the um, the importance of both the school department as well as the important role of the Parks and Rec. Uh, department in terms of serving families and serving young people in our community and um, and just the importance of us collaborating um, and sharing space and sharing resources so uh, thank you for that and um, and so and I'm sure that the chair of rules and policy is also appreciative this um, document makes me very happy <laughs> I love it thank you 
Um, can I move to uh, accept the agreement between the Northampton School Committee and the City of Northampton for joint use of school and recreation facilities? I'll second. second. Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded. Any discussion? Any questions? Uh, yes. Go ahead. I've, uh, well, I just want, had one question on um, under scheduling and use, how the decision that Florence Fields would be the exception, the recreation department, and how we kind of rank um, events in who has priority. Sorry, I feel like I'm not being very articulate, so, but um, that's the one set of fields that falls under a different it has a different ranking to it, so I was just curious. So special conditions surrounding Florence Fields have to do with the management of the um, site. It was designated <coughs> for organic management, mm -hmm. which means the fields experience ex uh, increased pressure from weeds and increased pressure from nutrient deprivation, I guess. Um, and because of that, the rec department has a sort of a more protective stance for those fields. But why would that change the ranking of who gets priority on using them? Uh, I think another matter that fed into <laughs> it was um, the fields have a history in involving their creation around mm -hmm. um, soccer programs. Um, huh. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Didn't know that. Okay. Yes, if you'd been, there was a meeting in this room that was filled to the gills with people that were complaining because soccer was being squeezed out of the Oxbow, and the city right. needs to find new recreation fields, and the Parks and Rec Department needs to find new soccer fields. And so the Parks and Rec Commission and Department went out and identified Florence Fields. We got grants, we got money, we went right, through the right. whole process yeah, no, and built the fields. And so. Just that was, for, I didn't realize it was just for soccer. It wasn't just for soccer, but part of it was there was use agreements that Parks and Rec had for soccer, and so that was part of the issue with um, is relocating soccer. I know that other sports have now uh, developed, uh, sports and clubs and things like that, um, but literally the fields were created because of a crunch of soccer fields and the fact that neighbors were feeling overwhelmed in the Oxbow area by all the traffic because it had not been a permitted, the expansion of the fields had not really been permitted, uh, zoned, or permits hadn't been applied for. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the backstory. Great, thanks. Yeah. My only comment? Yes. Please, I just really think it's a great agreement and that it has a little acknowledgement of the fact that it may need amending in the future mm -hmm. and, a, and a mechanism for doing that. And I really am very impressed with that part because I think <coughs> Frequently we have agreements where that's not so clear and, and they wait until things get really bad before they um, get adjusted. And I think this gives a chance maybe to continue to adjust as it goes along because it will go along. <laughs> and there is a stand, there is a committee that's going to be meeting on exactly. a regular basis, so that's good. It sets up a whole mechanism. Exactly. Yeah. Very, very so there's been a motion made and seconded. Any other comments? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the agreement is approved. Next, we have a discussion. This is uh, the, uh, Dr. Provost uh, regarding a Mass Department of Education uh, Pathways Grant Applications. It's actually multiple uh, applications to the Pathways Program. Thank you. The this is not one of the finer pieces of prose in your packet. Um, this is very clearly in draft form, and so I just want everyone to be aware of that. Um, the reason I'm bringing it forward in draft form tonight is this is a program that the Department of Education has launched on very tight timelines. Um, the program was announced late last spring, and applications came out in August with the requirement for districts that were interested in having a high quality college and career pathway designation to submit a letter of intent by September 1st. We submitted the letters of intent for these two um, pathways and the final applications will be due at the end of the month. Um, but since these have implications moving forward, I just wanted to get a sense of the committee as to whether it felt they were worthwhile activities. Um, I certainly feel that both of these pathways 
are worthwhile. As you can see, there's a, a lot of work that's gone into the process of developing the applications to this point and also developing relationships to this point. Um, all of the pathways require Northampton to establish or expand relationships with um, other educational agencies and um, local businesses. And so we've made the initial steps to that. Before uh, I get into it, talking about each pathway in detail, I would just direct your attention to the multicolored um, handout. This is sort of a one-pager explaining the high-quality high college and career pathways program. Um, this really um, was presented to superintendents and others at the conference in terms of the Department of Education's concern about the 80 percent of students who are not enrolled in vocational or technical education um, and a concern that they uh, may not always be prepared for this, to take advantage of the opportunities that our local economy provides in the way that students who do um, transition from vocational programs are. And so they were interested in high schools that wanted to develop either what's known as an innovation career pathway or an early, early college pathway. Um, the difference between the two lanes has to do with the amount of college um, involvement, as, as you might imagine. The early college pathway is designed for students um, who are, I, I guess I should back up a minute and say, both programs require the, the um, school to be creating a pathway that addresses a need that's been identified in the local workforce by the regional workforce board. In an early college pathway, that is um, a, an attempt to address a workforce need that requires some college degree. And so you're setting students on a path to take courses in high school to get them involved in a post-secondary program that will give them the credentials they need in order to be, become employed in the field. An innovation pathway is similar concept um, but it is for students who are interested in fulfilling a need that may not necessarily require a post-secondary degree. So the early college pathway requirement is that you're fulfilling a local workforce need, you're counseling students in a specific course of studies that will lead to um, a, a diploma that's applicable to that field, and have a minimum of 12 legitimately transferable college credits by the time students graduate from high school. The innovation pathway um, has a requirement for just six legitimately transferable college credits. Again, these are for um, employment opportunities that may not require college, but it's anticipated that in any field, not having a college degree may become a limitation at some point, and so they want students to have some college experience as part of the pathway so that they have those doors open to them in the future. So um, for both programs, you need to have a post-secondary education as the credit granting body. Um, so for both of these pathways, we have made connections with Greenfield Community College. And for the innovation career pathway, you need to have a connection with a local employer or business partner. We're, um, we've created a partnership with Tech Foundry, which is basically an incubator organization out of Springfield. They run 14-week programs. Their, their curriculum is constantly evolving because the way the 14-week program works is they go to the local employers in Springfield and say, within the IT sector, which is what they focus on, what are you going to be hiring in the next couple of months? We'll get a batch of students ready who have the um, whatever credentials you determine are necessary. So um, in our early college pathway, um, we're focusing on the need for educators. Um, it addresses a few issues. One of the things that the school committee has talked about many times is wanting to diversify the educator workforce. And um, I've been involved in the educator workforce diversity task force. And one of the things I've learned from the work on that committee is waiting until students are enrolled in college to try to in interest them in careers in education is really too late. 
a lot of students have already made the decision at that point. And the recommendation from the research we've been reading is to try to recruit and identify students, particularly students of the global majority, in high school. Um, so our goal with this is to get, we, we think we might be able to do eight students a year on a educator prep pathway. They would get 15 credits while they were still enrolled at, at Northampton High School. They would then go on to finish um, an associate's degree at GCC and then transfer to Westfield State. We're working on that part of the connection. Um, part of this also um, addresses an issue with education and, and sort of the shortages in education that everyone recognizes, and this sort of cuts across all racial lines. Students face very strong disincentives from families to pursue education because of the, the salary. Um, so one of the strategies that institutions of higher education are pursuing is how to reduce the cost of the bachelor's program in education in recognition that carrying a high level of college debt may be particularly difficult for educators. So um, the, the two and two program between GCC and Westfield State is already in the works to sort of reduce almost by 50% the cost of um, getting licensed as a teacher. If we could add the high school piece, you would be knocking off another piece. That you could get a bachelor's degree for possibly less than 50% of the face value. Um, so that's one college path, uh, one of the pathways that we're submitting and requesting designation for. The other one um, is the innovation career pathway, where again, um, this one we think will have probably more appeal to students. We think this may be able to take up to 20 students a year. Um, and again, we're looking really for sort of the 8% that signal to us they have no interest in any kind of um, education beyond high school, or maybe the 16% that we know that actually don't go on to um, college after finishing Northampton High, to give them a more reasonable, achievable, likely path to lead to a family wage. Um, so right now, uh, the, the workforce demands in IT in this area are tremendous. In some of the areas, there are three jobs for every applicant. Um, so it would be a way for us to, I think, really create better life outcomes for a large number of the students we serve who aren't on the path to getting into a two or four year program that our high school is really set up to do for kids. Um, I also say on the innovation pathway, this one appeals to me as someone who's lived in Hampshire, Hamden, or Worcester County for most of my life, um, all areas of the state that have similar kind of economic challenges. Um, you know from my advocacy for, to our legislators, we talk a lot about difference between East and West and the unfairness in the way this part of the state is treated. But, and they acknowledge, but sometimes they say, well, you guys need to, if you can't beat them, join them. You know, you need to get more sophisticated about workforce development. Um, it's really hard for this part of the state to be treated fairly if it doesn't have density of highly trained people that bring in employers that then create population growth, that then create political power. Um, so part of my interest in this other one is not just to help students find better outcomes, but to experiment with a different way of doing high school that may help Mass Western Massachusetts in particular um, find new ways of demonstrating its worth um, to the rest of the state, if you will. Okay. So these are three, uh, two, sorry, that you will be <laughs> applying, mm -hmm. will be applying for, the district will be applying for. And what's their time frame for? So we will be submitting the applications at the end of September. We'll know whether or not we achieve the designation for each of the pathways probably in October. We'll know if we've qualified for the, this round of competitive funding probably by December. Um, I didn't mention this in my um, presentation. It is important, so I'll add it at this point. Um, one of the goals of this program is to create a third stream of education funding. You know, you have Chapter 70 for K to, 
or pre-K to 12. You have chapter 74 for vocational education. So maybe this would be chapter 72, whatever. A dedicated stream of funding that's sort of like neither the traditional pre-K to 12 nor the traditional vocational as we know it, but sort of a in-between kind of model. So having the designation would allow us then to be eligible for funding if that, if that stream is, is dedicated. Okay. So any questions? Oh, Ms. Fallon. Uh, so I think I, these sound like amazing opportunities. I'm just, um, can you explain the Westfield part of it for the career pathway? I'm, there is no. Are they committing to, like, so they're committing to taking, to at least finishing the associates <coughs> at Greenfields? But then they could go on to any other school to, that offered a teacher education program, or would they have to, if Westfield signs on, finish up there for the? They, they could go uh, to any any school that participates in mass transfer. Um, we were very just a term of art. Um, the Board of Higher Education has created what's known as sort of mass transfer, um, which is a group of courses that all the community colleges and four year state universities agree to recognize and to um, allow transfer credits for. So all of the <laughs> courses in this pathway are mass transfer courses, so students would not be locked into going to GCC. Of course, I think they'd have an advantage because they would have already started the program there and would have um, oriented themselves to the campus, but they could transfer those credits to any community college or a Massachusetts State University system. And then once they finish at GCC, they would then be able to do the same thing, where they'd have a choice of teacher education programs? Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Ms. Fargamini? Yeah, I just have a few. Um, how many years is the funding guaranteed for, like, if we were to get the funding? How many years? It's not guaranteed for any number of years. Uh, okay. we, if we were to get the funding for this year, this is, like, the seed money for year one. They say that there's support for this at the state level i do believe that's true but i do know there are a number of potential fiscal crises on the state's horizon that could cause them to say forget it we have to it's a good idea but we have to save it for another time um i think that if the funding doesn't materialize i would still like to try to include it in a budget because i think i think we're we're experimenting with something here that could have value for kids and then um, you mentioned Northampton High students kind of being able to get credits at GCC while they were still at the high school. Would those um, classes be in addition to a course load at Northampton High or kind of like worked into their school day? Um, do you have any idea of, have you spoken to Mr. Lombardi about it? Yep. Um, like the Smith College program, it would, it would be, well, in my opinion, it would be more advantageous to students than Smith College because you would get college credit and high school credit for the same course. Now, in the pathway we've designated, some of the courses that you'd be getting GCC credit for are Northampton High courses that they've recognized. Um, we didn't even have to do an articulation agreement with them because they automatically award credit for AP classes, which is something a lot of colleges don't do. So. Um, Automatically, you'd be getting your, your credits towards high school graduation for those. And then there are other courses in the sequence. Um, one of them is Introduction to Special Education that would be a GCC class. You'd get another three credits from GCC, but you'd also get an elective credit at NHS for taking that, much in the same way as you get credits for taking courses um, through Smith College right now. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I was just kind of looking at it from a perspective of as a high school student trying to fill my course requirements at NHS and take courses that I want to take electives um, and take higher level courses um, with the kind of block scheduling that we have, only four courses in, in semester format. It can be tight to squeeze in everything. Okay. Mr. Moore and then. So I'm not clear exactly because we're applying for funding to do this. This is something we could do without we'd have to pay for it. We know that we would, right? Um, so what is the, what exactly is the, if we are get what we're applying for, what are they paying, what is the state paying for? So when you go to the very last part of both applications, uh, it's the competitive funding piece. They're offering this year up to $10,000 for pathways. Um, in both cases, what we said is we would hire someone to 
uh, basically oversee the program and assist students. Um, so, for example, one of the ways we're planning to run the program, and I think it's one of the educational pieces of this that makes it accessible to all students, is for students to use public transportation to get back and forth to GCC. But we know that all of our <coughs> students do not have sort of the real world survival skills to navigate the public transportation system, so that person would ride the bus with them, teach them how to do it. Um, that also, um, the, none of our students really know anything about the college enrollment process, how you try to transfer credits and all of that stuff, so it would be someone to oversee that. Um, okay. If we got a larger pot of money in future years, I think we would keep that piece, but then we would probably use the additional money to go towards cost of tuition, cost of materials, and other uh, pieces of the program. Ms. Burnham? Yeah. Um, so I had one question, and then I have a question because of what Howard brought up. How are students, um, do they apply to be part of this? You're saying that you have sort of room for a certain amount we, so going back to this um, yeah. document, career advising is an important part of the uh, program in either piece. Um, we are trying to recruit students. The amounts of the, the eight students and the 20 students that we put in the applications were based on students that we thought we might be able to pull in. Um, we think that may be ambitious because, especially in the early college pathway program, we don't hear a lot of students at high school talking about wanting to go into a career in education. So it wouldn't be necessarily a situation where we're um, asking students to apply. It would be more or less a situation of we're vigorously recruiting students who we think might have an interest and an aptitude to try to get them on the pathway. Um, in terms of the other pathway, the innovation pathway, um, we know, we know Right off the bat, 8% of our kids are telling us they're not going on to any kind of higher education. So we would say, well, okay, if you're not doing that, you should really think about this. Mm -hmm. You know, This can set you up for um, a better outcome in life than just not doing anything. Um, we also the, know that there's another 8% who say they're going, but don't go. And uh, the high school um, guidance department, I think, has a good sense of who those kids are the ones who are at risk um, and may need a backup plan. So in both cases, um, it's really a matter of us recruiting more so than students applying. Right, right. And going into, I mean, if somebody chose to do the, the educational path, doesn't stop them from then graduating and going on realizing that they want to do something else. No, that, I mean, that's I mean, one of the reasons why we chose all courses in the mass transfer packet, right. you know. That happens for students, whatever their plans are. Yeah, you know? exactly. Okay, and so to follow, my second question has to do with Howard, actually, and Elena as well, which is if the kids are taking um, public transportation, which I'm a huge fan of growing up in a city and knowing how to do it, and training my child how to use public transportation in Northampton, but saying that getting up to Greenfield is pretty far mm -hmm. um, on a tight school schedule. It's not walking down to Smith. How does that schedule work out? Are the classes at on the weekends, or I'm. So we looked at um, we looked at the college schedule, and we also looked at the courses that are offered in this sequence. We deliberately chose courses that were required for the associates program, and that were traditionally offered in late afternoon. So we would envision students taking that class after the end of the school day. So in a four block schedule, that would mean they'd probably have a opening somewhere else in the schedule. They might be kids who don't take a first period class, just do two, three, four at the high school and then get on the bus and take a college class. Excellent. Elena. And I just want to confirm, I think you kind of met, may have insinuated this, but would the bus passes for public transportation be covered by yes. you? Okay. Okay. Any other questions? So this is for informational purposes. There's no, um, no vote required. Um, so the next item on our agenda uh, is a vote to surplus um, math investigations to materials. 
as you know, we just made a massive investment in Math Investigations 3. Um, whenever you change over programs, it's really important <coughs> to get rid of the old program so that you can have a good high fidelity <coughs> implementation of the current program. Um, the Math Investigations 2, we've found in our research, has um, virtually no value. We haven't been able to find any other schools that want it. Um, the, we do have a taker, though, in Westfield State College who said that they would use the materials to um, orient their elementary ed teachers just so they have some idea what an investigational approach to mathematics is. Um, they will take care of all of the costs involved with picking it up, et cetera. But in order to make that happen, the school committee has to vote to surplus the materials. So I would entertain a motion to surplus the I make a motion to surplus the math investigations to materials. And also with great thanks to, I believe it was Dr. Cheevers that found a new home for these uh, mm -hmm. instead of sending them out to the landfill. But to give them one last purpose, mm -hmm. I'm glad that we were able to find that place. So. Second. Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor of the surplus, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? Okay. So those will... Go off. Um, the next item is a vote to increase the FY18 circuit breaker budget by $23,016 uh, due to increase in revenues. Yes, as we were closing out last year, we mentioned to you in that report that we had received in the final payment um, approximately $23,000 more than we had anticipated when we built the budget. The way circuit breaker funds work, which are meant to supplement special ed costs, are you have to use them in the year in which they're received or in 12 months following that fiscal year. So basically the money that comes in last year, we need to use this year. So in order to do that, we're asking you to vote to increase the circuit breaker budget for this year by the amount of $23,016. Okay. And make a motion to increase the FY18 circuit breaker budget by $23,000. $16 due to increase in revenues. Second. Okay. Been a motion made and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. <coughs> aye. aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So that increase is approved. Next, we have a vote uh, on a budget transfer to create an ESP position at NHS. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Provost. This position is requested because we've had a team meeting with a student who is placed in an out-of-district school requesting to return to NPS. Um, the student requires one-to-one -one support. This ESP would be funded from the money which was budgeted for tuition. Um, the net cost, it's actually a net savings to the district because the cost of the tuition is higher than the, the cost of the ESP. Okay. So... I'll entertain a motion for I make a motion uh, on the budget transfer to create the ESP position at Northampton High School second okay any questions about this one all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed any abstentions <coughs> okay so that transfer is approved next we have a report on the annual student activity account uh, report on interest use and I'll turn it over to our business administrator. Yes, the Department of Ed regulations around student activity accounts require the school committee approve the use of interest earnings on those accounts and also that there be a report to you on what the interest was used for. So we are continuing to clean up some of the bookkeeping process we've been talking about for a few years with the student activity accounts. We actually have our next three-year audit due any day. And I'm optimistic we're going to be in much better shape than we were three years ago and six years ago. Um, this is one part. This may be the first time this is actually coming to you, but it does show you the interest earnings on both the high school and middle school student activity accounts last year. And actually, in both cases, there were no expenditures from the interest. Um, you see there actually isn't that much interest earned with rates these days, but um, the funds are there. Your policy gives the principals the right to use the interest for the, the things I've outlined in the form and anything else they would actually come to you for approval to spend if they wish to do that. Okay. Uh, so um, any questions about that uh, report from members? Okay. Hearing none, we can move right into the regular business administrator report. Yes. Um, just a couple of things tonight. You've got the 
monthly financial expenditure report it does if you look closely at it a couple of the accounts do look a little strange and it's the way we went through this last year it's the way these reports look until the city actually closes the financial books in the munis accounting system so that's going to happen actually next week so the end of september reports should look a little more usual to us um, at this point there's nothing really jumping out at us in any of our accounts the gifts, there actually were no gifts accepted in the past month um, under your policy where the superintendent or the principals can accept gifts, but I'm sure that'll be picking up as we enter a new school year. And then the last piece will be a regular addition to this report. You voted in June, I believe, to designate one school committee member with a backup under the Municipal Modernization Act to sign the warrants. That legislation requires that there be a report to the school committee at a subsequent meeting as to what was signed by that designee. And it seems like the easiest way to do that will be, be to give you a copy of the warrant cover sheet for any warrants that have happened between meetings as part of this report. <coughs> so right now you've got the cover sheets for the five warrants that had been signed by the designee or the alternate designee in one case, um, totaling roughly $1.3 million for those five warrants. Okay, any, any questions about the, Ms. Fallon? So is there a way, it doesn't, I didn't notice that it said what it was, it was just the warrant number. Is there a way to like just put in parentheses like this was for cafeteria food or whatever on the warrant sheet? No, that's the stuff that the person signing it sees because the backup. Okay, so we'd have to go to your office. The backup to, to each warrant okay. is probably this thick. I think. Right, the I remember. One. Yeah, because yeah. when we used to sign them, but I didn't know if there was a way to do. So the references here are just batches. The way we submit them to the city is we get a batch of bills together and send it over because the city starts the review while we're continuing to work up until the minute the warrant closes. So this was just a reference if we have to go back as to which batches were on okay. each warrant that the school committee member signed. Okay. But yeah, if you'd wanted the detail, any one of these batches could have 50, 60, 100 bills right. on it. Okay. Got it. You're welcome to come in. I know. Though. I knew you were going to offer that. I will. <laughs> okay. Um, if you'd like to continue with the personnel report. Yes, August is a very busy month. Um, you'll see there are 28 hirings here. One was an administrator. One was an administrative assistant. And 26 were teachers, including 11 new elementary special ed teachers. And that directly relates for most of those positions to the new inclusion model that we implemented as part of the budget. So it's exciting to have that many new special ed teachers on board. Um, separations, you've got 13 separations. This was one secretarial position, five ESPs, and seven teachers. You actually may have noticed by omission there were no ESPs listed under the new hires and that's because our budget plan did work out successfully I think it was mentioned in August that by keeping the ESPs on rather than laying them off when we made the changes at the elementary level we were actually able to place all of them in programs and didn't have to go outside we were able to use experienced ESPs as people left the district so we haven't hired any yet um, and we also had five retirements to run through those quickly. Um, Julie Carose, High School Guidance Secretary. Um, Lori Farkas, our Director of Student Services. Sharon Matrician, Administrative Session Assistant at Ryan Road. Candace Tajer, Administrative Assistant at JFK. And Kim Broussard, Administrative Assistant at the high school. This was a massive year for the district in terms of turnover. Four out of our six administrative assistants in the schools turned over. So we've got a lot of new faces in the schools and a lot of training going on with them. And then we've listed a number listed a number of transfers and promotions that have ha happened within the system. A lot of those are the ESP positions I referred to earlier. Okay. Next, we have the superintendent's report. Thank you. We opened the school year with 188 new. Can't. Yeah, sorry, we don't we don't entertain questions from. This the... is actually a question. It's okay. Just, uh, I'd like to take a picture. Of Ferradino, Daily Hampshire Gazette, I'd like to take a picture of the number of the names of the people who uh, did the thing. Uh, it's a public record. I'll give this to the clerk and you can deal with the clerk. <coughs> Excellent. But I've, I've wanted to do it in public instead of just, you know, sneaking in the back and I have people have questions. Thank you. Okay. Starting over. 188 new kindergartners and facility repair projects going on at three of our elementary schools. Um, it's a little bit a little bit difficult. Um, we did have an evacuation. I shouldn't say evacuation. We did have a fire alarm yesterday at Leeds, which I did not 
bother to tell you about because it happened before school started and nobody was there. Um, but it, it has been um, a little bit of a challenge, especially in the Bridge Street area where the school is still surrounded by scaffolding um, and equipment. But I, I, I will say that the uh, contractors have been great at working with principals to try to um, minimize noise and disruption um, while the school day is going on. The pneumatic hammers are going right up to the first bell in the morning and then they stop. Um, they're out, they are lifting things and doing other, other things during the, the day. Um, but as one of the principals said, it is so much better to have uh, repair projects going on and have the, have the schedule running late than to just not having things being fixed. Um, so we are looking forward to those projects being done. The work uh, at Ryan Road, I believe, is completed. That was a, mu a much more minor project, just replacing some doors. Um, the roof, uh, roof construction continues at Bridge Street and at Leeds. Um, and hopefully it will be done by next month, but we will see. Um, so overall, our enrollment is up slightly from last year. But due to the resource reallocation that Ms. Walczak just mentioned in her report, we have achieved an elementary student to teacher ratio of nine to one. You have a document in front of you showing you the elementary student teacher ratios in the county. And you'll see um, that this is one of the most favorable student ratios, student to teacher ratios of anywhere in Hampshire County. Um, I think it's a real testament to the budget process that happened and the support the school committee had for new elementary model. Um, I'll also add to that that I've made 11 site visits to the elementary school since the start of school. And I've, what I'm seeing is very supportive classroom communities where diverse learners are truly accepted and affirmed. Um, this is a developmental process. It's going to take us many years to reach our highest level of practice with it but we're off to a very good start and we're starting with the spirit of trying to include all students and really put students in the center of the planning um, so i know that week three is not going to look as good as year five does um, but i'm very pleased with what i'm seeing in the elementary schools um, as i was sharing earlier this is anecdotal but i'll just share it one of the one of the noticeable things from discussions with teachers and principals about how today went, which is something we frequently do, is a lot of the um, places where we're seeing some of the most difficulty is in the kindergartens, which is the one grade that we decided not to make any changes in. Um, so um, I think that, that says something. I wanted to talk to you about our professional development days. As you know, in the new contract, we have two professional development days, and we decided to front load them both. I want to um, acknowledge Dr. Cheevers and her team for the work that they did on that and the Joint Labor Management Professional Development Committee because these two professional development days were a hit not only within the district but within the region with schools uh, attending on both days and asking to participate, and schools who didn't attend calling me up and saying, why didn't you ask us to be a part? Um, so um, the, the focuses or the, the foci for the, the professional development days were math investigations three, providing staff with frameworks to support in the inclusion work that we're doing, and anti-bias training. We brought in a high-powered team to assist the elementary teachers implementing the district's inclusion model. Thomas Hare from Harvard delivered the keynote address, address on one of the days. Um, he talked to the staff about ableism. Um, his talk really fed into the anti-bias work that we're doing. Um, and he shared his personal experiences as a public school teacher, a Department of Education staffer. This is Federal Department of Education and, and as a college professor. And he really encouraged staff to confront their own unconscious biases involving individuals with disabilities. Um, then Lisa Deeker, who I know some of you have had in your own districts, provided teachers with a much more practical um, and grounded experience in navigating what she calls the co-teaching dance. Um, she shared, shared her online collection of more than 380 tools for use in inclusive classrooms. And um, this was a professional development that was participated in 
by members of six other nearby districts who um, asked if they could be a part when they heard who was coming. Um, our anti-bias training was included two day-long workshops led by Barbara Love and her team, including Sapphire Young, Valerie Jignitz, Darnell Thigpen Williams, Paul Wiley, and Russ Vernon Jones. Um, they together provided hands-on workshops to help faculty and staff make their unconscious or implicit biases more conscious or explicit with the goal of making them available to judgment and control. Through a series of interactive and supportive discussions that happened both in large groups and small groups, the team brought the message that motivation matters, intervention works, and bias is malleable. The participants responded enthusiastically, requesting additional time with Dr. Love's team, and we are currently working on um, amending Title IV grants so that we can bring that team back to do more anti-bias work with us. The Math Investigations III training um, was also um, an opportunity for collaboration for us in a, a different sense and a group that we don't collaborate with enough, I think, because um, it's given us an opportunity to strengthen our professional ties with the Smith College Campus School. The Campus School has also <coughs> decided to adopt Math Investigations III this year and they asked if we would allow their staff to attend our professional development sessions regarding Math Investigations 3. Um, we said yes. What are you bringing to the table? And they've offered to reciprocate by sending education department faculty into our classrooms to assist our teachers with lesson study as they implement the new math program. It's one of the ways we can address um, sort of the inequity we've set up about having a literacy coach now but not having a math coach well, we don't have that, but at least we have college faculty who are also assisting teachers who are implementing the same math program, working with our math teachers. Um, and then the last thing that I would just like to report is our district literacy coach has started. Um, as you recall from last month's report, one of the things that the RTI evaluator stakeholders group said was, it's important to provide some more support for fourth and fifth grade because most of the intervention work is being done in K-1 and 2 and 3. Um, and so one of the ways we responded to that was by asking the literacy coach to focus on grades four and five first. And he has been doing that, averaging about five classes per day uh, where he focused really on assisting teachers implementing readers and writers workshop. That's my report. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Provost. Um, we have no new business on tonight's agenda. Um, I had one thing I wanted to mention, if you don't mind. Sure, sure. I came in late. Uh, I was wondering if an announcement was made um, this Saturday over at uh, the Jackson Street School. They're having oh, a the carnival. The carnival. Uh, Did anyone mention the carnival? No, I now I bring it up for a very good reason. I don't know if any of you had been oh. contacted, <laughs> but I will be taking to the dunk tank oh, so at three to four p.m. And there may be some <laughs> community members that might get great enjoyment of throwing some <laughs> balls to see if they can knock us into the water. So um, could someone speak to it better than I could? Well, it, I don't. It's. Do you know the hours of it? Um, yeah, it's ten till four. And I'll be in the dunking booth from 11 to 12. So if anybody wants to, <laughs> yeah, dunk me. <laughs> okay. Might I just add that I have the second shift in the dunk? <laughs> <laughs> so looks like there'll be a lot of targets there that yeah. day, so. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome, thank you for, for making that. Um, so uh, future business and meeting dates, um, a school committee meeting with the Student Advisory Committee, October 12th, 2017 at 6.45 p.m. here in the JFK Community Room, um, followed by our regularly scheduled full school committee meeting on October 12th, 2017 at 7.15 p.m. Um, there's also a rules and policy subcommittee meeting uh, scheduled for September 21st, 2017 at 3.30 p.m. in the superintendent's office. That didn't quite make it onto the, uh, to the listing. Um, I would now entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 Opposed, any abstentions? The meeting of the school committee is now adjourned.